So I'll be talking about genetic evidence for natural selection in humans in the contemporary United States, as the title suggests. All right, introduction. So until recently, it was often held that human evolution has come to an a had come to an end about 40,000 to 50,000 years ago. In fact, Stephen Jay Gould, who was a famous uh, biologist at Harvard and also a famous public intellectual, uh, famous he famously claimed that there had been no biological change in humans in 40 or 50,000 years. Uh, and this was the prevailing so-called conventional wisdom, uh, I'd say, until very recently. Now, privately, if you talk to biologists or geneticists, many would tell you that, no, of course, there's been evolution, you know. But still, this didn't really make it into the, uh, the mainstream thinking. Um, now, however, over the past decade, there's been accumulating evidence that suggests that natural selection has been operating in humans for the past few thousand years. So for instance, actually, some um, adaptations such as lactase persistence, um, resistance to malaria, adaptation to high altitude um, in Tibet, among others, um, and alcohol flush reaction, uh, mainly in East Asians, um, these have been documented and it's been pinpointed that they happened just a few thousand years ago. And in fact, the precise biological mechanism is now understood and um, so it's not really, this is well established. Um, so this is something that's been definitely established just over the last decade or so. Um, so clearly, we have evolved uh, over the past few thousand years. Uh, it's also been shown that height and body mass index have been under selection in Europeans. There's been several papers documenting that. Um, and um, so yeah, so that's a, a change of, of, um, of um, well, a change in terms of com comparing to the earlier conventional wisdom. Now, recent studies that examine the association between lifetime reproductive success, LRS, so I'll be talking about lifetime reproductive success a lot today. This is basically simply the number of children one has over one's lifetime, okay? So that's lifetime reproductive success. So there's recent, recent studies have examined the association between that and various phenotypes, and they typically find that natural selection has been operating in contemporary human populations. Um, however, these studies analyze phenotypic data and natural selection only occurs when the genotypes associated with the phenotype cover with fitness. Okay, so basically the issue with studies using phenotype is that you need to infer what this implies for the genotypes. Uh, and to do this properly, you need to do some assumptions. And as well, um, you need in principle to control for, uh, to account and control for all correlated phenotypes that are also under natural selection. For technical reasons, I cannot go into now. But all this to say that these studies clearly point towards natural selection having been occurring recently, but, um, but it's not conclusive, um, or at least not conclusive enough. Um, so in this paper that I'll be talking about today is entitled Genetic Evidence for Natural Selection in Humans in Contemporary United States. It was published in PNAS last year, last summer, about a year ago. Um, and as the title suggests, well, I'm looking for genotypic evidence for natural selection of just phenotypic evidence. So basically I leverage recent advances in molecular genetics uh, and I build polygenic scores and for various phenotypes for seven of them and then I look how these are associated with lifetime reproductive success in the health and retirement study which is a representative sample of Americans. Okay, um, okay so now going in more detail the data comes from the health and retirement study or the HRS for short, and it's designed, this study was designed to be representative of the US population over the age of 50 years old, which makes it possible in principle to generalize my results. And that's an important feature because if you just take a selected sample and you see an association between lifetime reproductive success and the score for some variable, then you know it could be just sample selection. But the sample was designed to be representative. Now there are some caveats on this, I'll talk more about them at the end. Uh, such as it's not perfectly representative, the sampling was just for people about 50 years old, not everyone were genotype, but still. Um, second feature of this data set that's good for us is that the individuals in the study are in the later age, later stage of their lives, when they have typically completed their lifetime reproduction. So it's good when doing studies that involve reproduction to have uh, males and females, females that are above 45 years old at least, and males that are above 50 years old, okay? Now I defined the study sample uh, for my analysis uh, as the following. I took all unrelated individuals of European ancestry. Again, the reason I focus on European ancestry individuals is to mitigate issues related to population stratification, um, as is usual in this type of research. 
Um, and the reason I don't take another group is because they were much smaller samples. This was just a larger sample available, um, the larger group uh, in terms of uh, number of observation, the HRS. I also focus only on individuals born between 1931 and 1953. Um, the reason I do this is because younger cohort, there were some younger, I mean, some cohorts born before 1931, but these had um, quite, uh, there, were sim there were signs that there has been a selective mortality, uh, so this could have biased the results. And then the younger cohorts, born after 53, had very few uh, individuals that had been genotyped. And I used individuals that are at least 45 years old for females or 50 years old for males when asked the number of children they ever gave birth to or fathered to ensure that this was a good proxy for completed reproduction. Okay. I did some robustness check actually using even older individual <coughs> and an older age as a cutoff and it's still robust to that. Okay, uh, the main dependent variable is relative lifetime reproductive success or RLRS, which is defined as the ratio of LRS to the mean LRS of individuals of the same gender born in the same years. Okay, so it's basically the number of, of children one has divided by the mean number of children of people in that cohort, okay? Uh, and lifetime reproductive success is the number of children an individual has, as I mentioned, al mentioned already. Now, the reason we use RLRS is twofold. First, uh, it controls for, it accounts for time trends in number of children across time, um, and sec across cohorts. And second reason is, as we'll see later, it allows me to translate my estimates into rates at which natural selection, estimates of rates at which natural selection has been occurring. Okay? Uh, we'll see that later. Um, and it's typical in this literature to use RLRS. Um, now, the independent variables of interest are seven phenotypes in the prologenic score. They include BMI, body mass index, educational attainment, or EA, fasting glucose concentration, or GLU, height, or HGT, schizophrenia, SCZ, and plasma concentration of cholesterol, TC, and age at menarche, uh, which is first menstruation, in females only. Um, and the reason I picked those seven traits is at the time I did the paper, uh, these were, uh, the, basically they were the, the, the traits for which the large GWAS were available, and also for some of them, uh, there had been previous evidence of uh, phenotypic evidence that natural selection was still occurring. Um, so basically, I took the largest GWAS available to create scores for these traits. Um, now, the control variables include birth year dummies, HRS defined cohort dummies, it's just like some uh, nuisance parameter, and uh, the top 20 principal components of the genetic relatedness matrix. I don't control for sex here simply because I do the analysis separately for males and females, but when I pull the two together, I control for sex. Um, now, um, the now let's look at the phenotypic evidence in the HRS before we look at the genotypic evidence. So the HRS contains phenotypic variables for four of the seven phenotypes for BMI, education attainment, height, and total cholesterol. Uh, and for the three others, there was no phenotypic data on the HRS. And for each of these, I regress RLRS on the phenotype and on the control variables, okay? So basically what this does is if basically, well actually, let's look at the result and I'll explain how to interpret this. So here are the results. These are the results from eight separate regressions. So each regression is for one trait in one of the two genders. Um, and what we see here is that BMI, so basically this regression was a regression of RLRS on the left-hand side and BMI, phenotypic, on the right-hand side and then the control variables, okay? And what we see here is that for females, BMI is positively associated with reproductive success. In other words, stouter female tend to have more children, okay? Uh, for education attainment, the association is negative. For height, it's negative also. And for males, we find similar effects, although the effect for education attainment is smaller and there's no effect for height, okay? So what this tells us is that basically for BMI in females, it tells us, as I said, that stouter females tend to have more children, okay, at the phenotypic level, yeah? Was this just in the genetic sample? Uh, no, that's for the full sample. However, when I do the same regressions, um, phenotypic regression, only the genetic sample, only for the individuals that I use for genetic regression, I get a very similar result. Okay, I guess yeah. you could worry that like, so education is gonna like, like people with more education live longer, right? Yep, absolutely. Like, the image of that sample, like same, same thing could be true with this outcome, what is it, the relative, like, yeah, reproductive success? Yep, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, no, that's a good question, actually, and that's something I discussed in the paper. So, I, in the paper I was careful, that's why I also use this birth range of 31 to 53, because I found uh, that there was less evidence of selection and mortality on this. But the other thing I did is I did this regression 
Uh, this is for all the data, all the individuals that have data that I can run this regression, but I replicated it only on the, re using only the individuals that I use in the genetic regression, which I haven't shown you yet. But, um, and the results were almost identical. Okay. Um, all right, so basically, based on this, there appears to be evidence for natural selection. And, uh, but then, as I said again earlier, um, just association at the phenotypic level doesn't necessarily prove that selection has been occurring at the genotypic level. Uh, number one, uh, we need to make assumption about how this phenotype translates to the genotype. But number two, more importantly, um, for technical reason I can go into now, uh, we need theoretically to account for all correlated traits for which selection also occurs. I can talk about th this later if you want. Um, so now let's look at the genetic evidence for natural selection. So I constructed polygenic score for seven phenotypes. Uh, and for this, I used the sum stats from the latest GWAS for each phenotype. And all some stats are from meta-analysis that include the HR, uh, that exclude the HRS. And I thank Aizu, uh, whom you met earlier, for creating the one for EA. And for the others, I was able to create, because EA, the main GWAS of EA included the HRS. So we had to create a special. Um, for the other ones, I, uh, I was able to do myself. Um, and the scores were constructed with LDPRED using the individual genotype SNPs. And the results are robust using the Plink score with all genotype SNPs. So actually, we talked about this earlier. And I said, um, you know, what, what do we do when we can select different LD Pred score? And my, my favorite approach is um, when possible to do just robustness check using the Plink score using all genotype SNPs. Um, so that you don't have, you kind of tie your hands this way. You don't have to, you cannot get to pick the score you like. Um, and here are, the, here are the R squared of the polygenic scores. So in blue, we have the R squared from the previously reported GWAS. So if we see for BMI, um, and this is the R squared on the Y axis, and on the X axis, you have the different traits. There's five of these here. Uh, the other two, uh, we just didn't have phenotype in the HRS, and their GWAS did not report R squared, so there was nothing to report here. So for BMI, what we see is that the R squared in the previously reported GWAS was about 6%, and in the HRS was about 8%. For education attainment, the R squared from EA2, the paper, was about 4%. And here was about 7%. The reason for this big difference here is because um, in the paper, we had used uh, a sample of about 300,000 individuals. Uh, and then we replicated those results in the UK Biobank. But then for the score in the HRS, I was able to um, uh, get the scores that combine the 300,000 individual, the GWAS from 300,000 individuals with the UK Biobank. So it was a much larger, it was a larger data set. Um, these were based on the larger GWAS. For height, the R square is around 17%. For schizophrenia, about 7% or so. And for total, total cholesterol, it's quite low. It's around 2%. Um, OK, so then for each phenotype, I regress RLRS on the phenotype scores and on the control variables. So basically, I do the same thing as for the phenotypic regression, but with the scores. Um, and here are the results. And again, these are set estimates from separate regressions. So here we have seven regressions for females and six regression for males. And what we see is that the score or EA of EA is significantly negatively associated with lifetime reproductive <coughs> success in both females and males. As well, the score of age at menarche is suggestively, at the 10% at the level, positively associated with production. Um, so what this tells us, essentially, is that uh, individuals with genes for whether that have more genetic variants that are positively associated with education tend to have slightly fewer children okay now um, I should mention actually I should mention these results are consistent with uh, um, a, a sizable previous phenotypic literature finding that education attainment is negatively associated with number of children but again as I said this was phenotypic literature uh, so I think the evidence from the phenotypic uh, literature is pretty uniform, with a few exceptions. Some don't find this, but typically they find this negative association. And also I should mention there are two other player papers that do um, something similar. There's a paper by Dalton Conley, who you've met last week, uh, that does, uh, was also published in the HRS, uh, in the PNAS um, journal, and found something similar, that is a negative association between the score and, reprodu and reproductive success. And there was a paper in January in PNAS also by Augustin Kong et al. that uh, in a much larger sample also finds something very, sif very similar. Uh, that is a negative association between the score for EA and reproductive success. Yeah. Is the intuition for the AA and the score that um, later age of menarche signals greater reproductive fitness? It's a good 
It, it's a good question. Actually, I don't know. Uh, we were surprised. I was surprised to find this, and others too were surprised by this. Huh? Exactly, exactly. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about the comparison between what these results are and what we've observed um, in terms of change over the last century. Um, okay, so so far we have a bunch of regression estimates, uh, but that doesn't tell us anything about rates of selection. Uh, and what we care about is to know what is the pace at which selection occurs. Um, so for this we need to introduce a concept of directional selection differentials. So directional selection differentials of a trait is the directional selection differential of a trait is the change in the mean value of the trait due to natural selection in one generation, okay? Um, so the Robertson price identity is a famous identity in evolutionary biology that states that the, it can be derived mathematically, it states that the directional selection differential of a trait is equal to the genetic covariance between the trait and relative fitness, okay? So in other words, the Robertson price identity says that the change in the value of a trait in one generation due purely to natural selection is equal to the genetic covariance between the trait and relative fitness. And here our measure of relative fitness is RLRS, <coughs> okay? So with some math that's in the appendix of the paper if you want to see it, uh, but I, can't, I don't have the time to show now, my estimates imply that natural selection has been operating on the score of EA, okay, at rates of negative 0.22, uh, per, uh, years of education per generation for, male, for females and the same, negative 0.022 for males as well. So in both cases, it corresponds to about negative one week of education per generation for both sexes. These are very slow, I mean, you know, very slow s rates of selection. Yeah. yeah. So it seems to, for a calculation like this, you need to assume that a generation is the same length. For Correct. Your, your, yeah, so, so and, and that doesn't, because not only do more educated people tend to have yep. fewer kids, but they have kids later, right? So that would extend the length of each generation. Yeah, yeah. So that, that would, you're, you're right. So I, 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 uh, I talk about these caveats in the paper, and I'll talk about them in the last slide. But basically, no, that's a very good point. So my measure of fitness is relative lifetime reproductive success. And that does not account for a reproductive cycle. More educated people tend to have longer reproductive cycles. So actually, that would make the effect more negative, OK? Um, now, as well. Uh, this is the estimates for the score of EA, but ultimately we don't care about the rate, the estimate, the, the rate of selection for the score of EA because that's just a noisy measure of the true genetic component for educational attainment. So under some assumptions, the directional selection differential of EA is equal to the directional selection differential of the score of EA multiplied by the irritability of EA divided by the R squared of the score of EA. Okay? Uh, and the math again is in the appendix. So based on this, my estimates imply that natural <coughs> selection has been operating on EA at rates of about negative 1.30 months of education per generation and negative 1.53 months of education per generation among U.S. females and males of European ancestry born between 1931 and 1953. Um, so we're talking about negative 1.5 months per generation based on these estimates. Now, these rates of selection are relatively small and it's important to compare these with the rates of phenotypic changes that we've observed recently. So my results suggest that natural selection has been operating relatively slowly versus the rapid phenotypic changes over the past few generations. So to illustrate, the mean level of education attainment increased by 6.2 years for native-born American born between 1876 and 1951. So that's about two years per generation of increase, presumably due to cultural, socioeconomic, um, policy, and environmental changes of all sorts. Okay? So these two years per generation compared to my estimates of negative 1.5 months per educa of education per generation. Okay, so basically what we've seen is uh, environmental override of the genetic effect, a massive one, okay? Uh, also for age at menarche, uh, my estimates suggest that uh, weak suggestive evidence for positive selection for it, whereas in reality, age at menarche has substantially decreased in contemporary Western populations, okay? Again, presumably because of countervailing environmental, socioeconomic, and other change, non-genetic changes, okay? So all this to say, the bottom line so far is natural selection is occurring, or has been occurring, um, subject to some caveat I'll discuss in the last slide, but at slow rates, and rates that are dwarfed by cultural changes and um, non-genetic changes, okay? So it's not as though genetic is destiny at all here, right? Um, Okay, to conclude, I'll talk about those caveats now. 
Uh, several caveats apply to these results. So first, uh, as I already alluded to, RLRS is not a perfect measure for fitness. Um, as Patrick mentioned, uh, it does not account for re reproductive cycle. So basically, if more educated people tend to take more time, um, well, tend to reproduce at a, longer, at a later age, uh, then less educated people, this will bias the estimates. Okay? In fact, it would make the estimates more negative in this case. Uh, another reason why RLS is not perfect is because there might be a quantity quality trade-off. I'm not sure there is much of one in you, for humans, but anyways, possibly, the te theoretically, there could be one, and definitely for some animals, such as sometimes having fewer in children and investing more in them can lead to more grandchildren than having more children and investing less in them. In, less in them. So ideally, the measure of fitness would be number of great, 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 great grandchildren, you know, but in practice, that's not always feasible. Um, and also, another caveat is that it's not possible to translate my estimates into projected evolutionary changes over more than one generation. So one reason for this is simply because the environment uh, or culture changes. So these estimates apply for people born between 1931 to 53. But maybe the selection gradient in today, today is different. So I wouldn't venture into projecting my estimates out of this uh, birth cohort. Uh, a second reason for this is simply as more technical. Uh, it has to do that mathematically when you want to project those estimates, you need to account for the covariance matrix of all correlated traits. Um, and then even with genetic estimates, um, you cannot project without having this full covariance matrix. Now, my rates of estimates are, with genetic data are not biased, despite the fact I don't control for all correlated traits, but for the projection, they would be. Okay. Um, now, the results in my study sample may not be fully generalizable to the entire U.S. population of European ancestry born between 1931 and 53. So I've said that the HRS is a representative data set, but, um, well, first, it samples only people, the, the main sampling strategy is to pick people 50 years and above, and then they pick their spouse also. <laughs> but based on U.S. Social Security data, about 10% or more of individuals born during that, those like in the early 30s, did not reach age 50. So that's quite a massive mortality selection bias. The other thing is not even one word genotype, but as I <coughs> mentioned earlier in response to your question, I, I did my best to try to limit the sample to uh, the birth year where I thought there was less selection or no selection. And also, when I compared the phenotypic regressions for the sample of all individuals, the sample of genotype individuals, I get basically the same estimates. Keeping those limitations in mind, my results strongly suggest genetic variance associated with EA have been slowly selected against in my study sample, but the rate of selection is very slow versus the rapid increase in EA. And my results suggest that age at menarche may have been under selection also in females, although just suggestively here. Future research can attempt to replicate my results by using even more representative samples, more precise scores, and alternative methodology and on that note, I should say that this has already been done by the Kong et al. paper, as I mentioned, in a much larger sample in, the, in Iceland. Um, and that's it. Thank you.